Well, leaders, welcome back. Hey, I got him. I got him on the show. And no one's going to believe me until they actually see it. I'm the one who needs introduction here. I'm Mike Temple, business leadership experts. Want to welcome everyone back, viewers, listeners. And who is that? You know it, Mr. Reggie Grant himself. Reggie had a distinguished career at the University of Oregon with the Ducks, playing defensive back. After the University of Oregon, he was drafted. And now I say drafted with the New York Jets. This is this is not a man who just had a cup of coffee with the Jets. He was at the buffet. All right. He was <laughs> <laughs> he was waited on hand and foot. <laughs> After the Jets, he spent some time in the Canadian Football League. For those of you who are educated, it's the CFL with the Ottawa Red Blacks. And he is now the co-founder of eSports Instruction. Reggie, if we're in front of a live crowd, we'd have to wait for at least a minute or so, minute and a half. Right. Any, any <laughs> ovation. I got to put my hands up. I got to put my hands up. Well, Reggie, welcome. I appreciate you finding some time to join us today. It is my pleasure, Mike. Reggie, educate us a little bit. With you. We're going to get into your career here a little bit later. But what does eSports instruction do, and how are they helping former athletes now? We have, uh, well, we're real simple. We just connect the dots. We're, we're a coach and work with a lot of uh, former players and, and different elements. We have uh, four different components, ESI pitch, athlete tech, and business. We do bit coaching and, and working with founders and CEOs and help those to navigate the process of transitioning out of sports uh, or where they're at in terms of their company work with other people too as well as athletes uh, but we you know help them generate revenues position their create culture of success um, position themselves to actually raise capital if they need to do those things so and, and through that we do like again esi pitch athlete tech and business which is one of our lanes we have athletes in art so the guys that are artists we help them we do events we just had an event in the super bowl week and we have athletes in cannabis. So we're talking about the whole ecosystem in terms of what's happening in that space. And then our latest thing is NFTs by athletes, which mm. we launched some NFTs at the end of the month. So, and mm -hmm. that's non-fungible tokens. And it's just uh, a way for guys to leverage their brand Excellent. creators and, and to get compensated. Okay. okay, very good. Folks, I thought I knew what digital assets were, NFTs, but Reggie uh, did a fantastic job of explaining what can NFTs have on athletes today. And it, it's, it's a much different world today than it was, you know, years ago. Uh, Reggie, if I'm a former athlete, I have some talent from, you know, from signing a, um, you know, <laughs> a football or creating my own work of arts. How, how do NFTs help athletes, former athletes today? Well, athletes, creators, entertainers, a person can actually take a, uh, in the old days, we had what they call trading cards, you know, with physical trading cards, you trade those around. And if you had a card and maybe a, a guy autographs a card and now the value goes from $25 to 200 bucks or something, he sells it one time and that's it. The <laughs> beauty and the, of the NFT is you will get paid every time that particular item changes hands. Mm. able to get paid on the back end in perpetuity, I guess that's the word you will want, forever, right? Mm. So if I sign this little thing or I create an NFT, from mm. there, it, I sell mine for 200 bucks, it sells for 2000 a year later, I would get um, a percentage of that sale every mm. time it transfers to a new owner. So that's the beauty of it, it allows the creative or the athlete or the a uh, person to actually get compensated on the back end for their talent, their creativity, their brand, that kind of thing. Wow. That's, it's a new day, Reggie. <laughs> new day, baby. One thing is for sure, change. It's... And change is always not. Adapt, <laughs> test, or die like a dinosaur. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, who didn't have? I mean, I, I, I grew up, I was a kid, uh, you know, you know, middle school, high school, you know, back in 78 or so. Who didn't have some type of a trading card, you know, from Tops? And I can't rem remember the other one. And uh, of course, your mom, your parents throw them out after you move out from college, thinking, you know, these things are, you know, worthless, ridiculous. Exactly. <laughs> and you're like, mom, what did you do? That was, 
<laughs> that could have paid my that's, tuition. That's money in them cars. My dad <laughs> saved cars many years, and I have uh, thousands of them rise. My wife said, don't sell them. You know, we can leave them for the kids. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. Hey, man, these things would have held. Hey, let's be honest. These things would have held past the Beanie Babies and Cabbage Patch. Cabbage Patch Kids. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is real. This is real. Yes, they do have some, you know, find that gym that has some value, real money. <laughs> well, well, sir, since I, ha since I have you here, you know, people are always interested, you know, in who was the professional athlete with athletes way back when. So let me ask you something. In high school, if I'm hanging around Reggie Grant, what kind of a guy is Reggie in high school? Well, he's, he's pretty focused. He's pretty driven, uh, especially after about my 10th grade year in high school. I realized that everybody in the world that, that runs things had college degrees. So I kind of turned my focus and uh, figured that my parents could not afford to uh, pay for me to go to college. So I needed to figure out a way to get into college. And and uh, athletics seems to be my my um, engine, my car, as you, as you would, my vehicle that I I needed to get some grades and I needed to leverage that academic uh, skills and abilities and genetics and, and get, find a way to pay for college. So, you know, I was a pretty introverted kid, pretty shy, uh, not quite a talker. And I was Reggie until I was about 15 and my name appeared in a paper and all of a sudden I was Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, kind of like, uh, I can't remember, you know, but, but a couple of athletes have said that. So, hey, I never gave myself these nicknames. The press gave me these nicknames. Exactly. It, it, you know, now you said something, you know, the focus, you know, no. the drive, you recognize uh, college ball was probably going to be your vehicle. But you said you were a quiet, more shy, introverted person. That's not, when did you, that's not the Reggie Grant of today. When did you develop this bigger than life personality? Well, I've always had that inside of me, but I'm, again, I am truly an introvert. I just have evolved the skills of being able to communicate with people effectively. And and when I was in college and, you know, you guys interview, I see you guys interviews and they'd be following me. And I was like, look, I represent me and the Grant family and <coughs> University of Oregon. So, <coughs> excuse me, I need to do that at a high level. So I used to uh, get in the, in the bathroom and, and, and look in front of the mirror and just practice my little speeches. So uh, that's kind of how I started evolving the skills and the ability to be able to, to communicate effectively and, and uh, you know, represent my people well. Good, good. It, it still works today. Look, Reggie did it. You've heard it. Go to the bathroom, practice your speech, practice whatever <laughs> in front of the mirror. Look at this man now. <laughs> okay. He's, he's living... He's living testimony. If you get in front, get in the and, bathroom. And, and get recently, that, my daughter was uh, one of my, my middle daughter. <laughs> now, Reggie, when you were at University of Oregon, you had an interesting scenario because there you were under Coach Enright and Coach Reed, and both of those coaches they they struggled a bit, and then comes in the man where it all started for the for the University of Oregon Ducks. Coach Brooks turns things around. What was the difference between Enright and Reed, you know, and their ways and Coach Brooks? Well, the Enright and Reed were in over their heads. World-class programs that competed at the highest level in that in that D1 um, five of the Big Five or whatever they call it now. Um, that's you know, it's a corporation. It's a real deal. You have to manage. Uh, 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 people and you have to manage processes and procedures and Brooks was a world-class professional right he came in and got those things done he was about his business and uh, he instilled that in us and he laid the foundation for what the University of Oregon is now he laid that foundation because of his personality his leadership abilities his abilities to get people to be self-motivated um, and and be be uh, focused on success mm hmm yeah. Now, as you mentioned, I think back uh, when you were playing, Reggie, it, it was the Pac-8. Yes. Um, Old like day. The, the real day. The real, the original <laughs> Pac. When the original Pac was running together. Do I dare, you know, I, I'm not going to offend the others who joined late, okay? But, you know, seriously, Colorado. But anyhow, people, don't don't laugh at that. All right. So, Reggie, now, you know, you're, you're you're practicing on your skills from high school, as you meant, as you said, you know, developing this personality. 
But now you're going from high school ball to division one, D1 ball. What are some of the characteristics that helped you succeed from high school to D1? Well, again, my parents, my father, Willie Joe Grant, and my mother, Juanita Grant, were um, focused on, on pushing us towards education was the key. It was the thing that leveled the playing field, regardless of who you are. You could elevate your skills and your knowledge and your passion uh, and have an open doors of opportunity by becoming educated. And then I realized that uh, intellectual property thoughts were the most powerful thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my dad had a, a intense work ethic and no matter what was happening in his life, he's always focused and, and uh, we were, you know, moved from Atlanta, Georgia to Seattle, Washington to give my brother, my sister, myself the opportunities to evolve and, and be the best us that we could be. And so mom and dad, again, moved 3,000 miles to give us those opportunities. And wow. so I just had to um, take advantage of those opportunities <clears throat> they presented us with. Hmm. So you've, you've worked with so many different coaches from, from a position coach to your head coach high school, college, um, you know, and uh, professional, who were some of the, who were, who were some of the coaches that had the biggest impact or people on your life? Well, again, pe pe people would be my father, my mother, most, most certainly, because again, my father was a dynamic work ethic. My mother uh, didn't graduate from high school. I was born and she ended up uh, getting a GED and becoming a political consultant for the both for the Democratic and Republican parties. And, mm. and uh, but you know, my dad was just, just stalwart. He was just there every day, grinding it out. He got laid off at Boeing, worked at Boeing for 28 years on and off for most of the, those last 20 years, he was pretty consistent. But uh, you know, early in the early stages, Boeing was going through rough times and they'd lay people off for six months a year. And he would, you know, wow do his thing and i remember him even sometimes we had four or five uh, paper routes and he'd get up at two in the morning and go and deliver those things and we still ate you know we weren't eating steak and filet mignon but we were never without meals and never without love uh or encouragement to do the right thing and move forward in a positive way so dad was you know my my hero and coach goodwin the basketball coach at chief south high school go seahawks was um <laughs> was a, a great uh, person that was always positive and positive and elevated and 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 saw the best uh, in me and and uh, just encouraged me to do do some good things. I I love hearing the background that your your biggest influence were your parents. I love hearing when your dad and of course your mom hitting hard times. First of all, the move from from Georgia to to Seattle. Uh, to put the family in a, in a position to be better off. And, and how many men today, when running against these obstacles, would take valuable work and not make any excuses, you know, and, and get things done? I, I, right. They call me get boo-boo done Grant. But, I <laughs> but uh, again, that comes from dad. Um, Willie Joe was a he's a phenomenal man, and I, I you know have fond fond memories of of uh, you know being six and him letting me win a race from we running up the hill from pick me up from school and and just you know he always was just there. They always went to all my little sporting events and activities. Myself, my brother, my sister. Uh, I'm the oldest of the three children, and um, you know there was always things along the way that you never realize impact you in a positive way. I'm a black man. I'm a black whether I'm at the golf course. And uh, or I'm at you know going looking for soul food in, in South Central. I live in Los Angeles, um, but I remember an incident when my youngest brother, when we were traveling those three thousand miles uh, from Seattle to Atlanta, or from Atlanta to Seattle, and my brother got very ill over by Spokane, Washington, mm -hmm. and a lady had, had was on the plane, white lady, had uh, said to my mom, "You have such well mannered little kids." Da 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 da. And my brother got sick and then stopped the train in Spokane and we had to get off and mom's all discombobulated, Elgin's all discombobulated and ill. And uh, this lady takes us towards her, her house and, and takes care of us uh, for a couple of days. And, you know, I got to sleep, sleep on some silk sheets for the first time in my life. And, you know, but it taught me a life lesson that people were good or bad, had, regardless of their color or where they came from. Um, so, you know, that something that really 
that helped me along my life cycle was the fact that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're black or white or, or wherever you're from or whoever you are, people are inherently good or bad, regardless of their race or, or their background, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't judge a book by its cover. And I've always uh, used that, you know, in my life is to evaluate people for who they are, the quality of the person, not the color of their skin. Mm. Another seed planted in your life. Yes. Right. Yes. It, by just an act of kindness out of nowhere. Right. It later flourishes into developing the man that you are now. Exactly. It added positivity to me. It, added, it elevated me and it gave me some grounding and understand that all people, you know, whether they're Republican or Democrat, black or white, uh, you know, can be put in it into a box. You have to evaluate people for who they are and the mm -hmm. value that they bring to your life. And those people that are not worth having in your life, you just kick them to the car, cut them out <laughs> like they can't. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we we got to get down to a 55 man roster. <laughs> I got to go, baby. I love you. You're nice, but I got to cut your behind. <laughs> Well, Reggie, as you're going through this, talking about some seeds that are planted, were there any players that had a, a positive impact on you as a person? Well, players, um, I, I, again, you know, I, I developed many positive relationships along the way. And it was always by people that um, added value to my life in a positive way. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I have developed many friends, Keith Gunther and I. Um, still have conversations. He was my team back at the teammate at the University of Oregon. And we were freshmen together we were in that freshman class of 73. And, and we still, you know, have conversations. We were on a Zoom call last week talking about NFTs with a whole bunch of people, including the Kobe Dean, the projected first round pick from Georgia. His mom was on that call. So, you know, you connect with people and, and you, you connect with some of them for life. Some people come in for a season, for a minute, and some people just come mm -hmm. in and, and you're able to live a lifelong, uh, develop lifelong friendships and relationships and, and just respect people for who they are. So you also mentioned uh, off camera, Edgy, that you were a hard worker and that was part of your characters. Your dad was a hard dad worker. Was, dad was a beast. Yeah. <laughs> That just got it done. No planning, yeah. no complaining, just went out there and did the deal, right? And so, you know, I tend to gravitate towards those people that have that kind of work ethic. You want to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Surround yourself with people that can give you balance and different kinds of perspectives. My wife will go to a place and she will meet any and everybody in the room and know their colors and their grandkids and all that. Me, I'm not that quite, I'm better at talking to a thousand people than I am one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, we evolve our skill set and, and just try to be the best person we can be. But you want yeah. to elevate yourself and other people by being around people that elevate you. Mm. I, I have learned in my life and through working with uh, business owners and leaders that values do one of two things. They attract people to you based on the similar values that you have. And they also repel people based off they don't resonate with those values. And those are the people that uh, that you attract, you come together based on those values. A player could have a positive impact, impact on you, Reggie, and they may not have ever touched the field, but that doesn't make any difference. You know, uh, sometimes the opportunity just isn't there, but if they have that positive impact, you know, and you find that commonality, I work my butt off, you work your butt off. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe you play tight end, but we're four deep at tight end and, you know, and I'm Reggie Grant, I'm starting. But <laughs> so that's to me, that, that's what values do and instilled by your dad. And as for whether Democrat or Republican, Reggie, you don't have a choice because your mom worked for both parties as a consultant. So <laughs> you're in it. You're in it. A great out outlook. Yeah. So, Reggie, in, in college, who was the best wide receiver that you saw in college? Uh, actually, I was a freshman. We were playing the University of Southern California in the Coliseum. Um, and I saw Lynn Swan do a 360 where he jumped in the air, turned around and pirouetted in the air, caught a ball behind him and, and just came down like it was effortless. It was it was a thing of beauty. It was physically impossible, but he did it. Uh, so, yeah, Lynn Swan was a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. Uh, and then, you know, I got to practice against Wesley Walker, who played many years for the Jets up there. And, uh, you know, I saw a lot of great, great athletes. I remember playing Oklahoma and seeing the Selman brothers 
and we got beat down like dogs and 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 and, and <laughs> <North. laughs> but you know I was my sophomore year I got my first interception out of about 15 tackles and and I started talking to pro scouts after that so wow hey it, no shame in getting beat down by elevate to the competition level and on a big stage I was a big baller <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey Reggie no shame in getting beat down by the Salmon Brothers. They did it at Oklahoma. They did it at Tampa Bay. No shame. All right. I mean, that, <laughs> you were on the field with them. You weren't in the stand. Players. They were deep. You know, their third best lineman was good as our first best lineman for, for, for most of them. Right. But they were, you know, um, a machine. They're like Alabama is now. They're a machine, an organization. And, and you know, um, Saban just leads by putting together world-class people and getting them to play together. And that's really what a successful leader does in his company as well. It's the same principles. It's just applied to different elements of life. So now, Reggie, you're wrapping up your college career. You're heading into the NFL. What what round were you drafted in the NFL? Ninth round. Ninth round. Ninth round. Fourth of five DBs picked. We had 17 defensive backs in camp. We had wow. six safeties. And hey. what, what was that? You know, 11 corners. And they kept three corners. Two of us were rookies, Bobby Jackson and myself, but we still stay in contact. And they kept three of the six uh, safeties. But again, uh, three of those 12, 11 corners they kept. So it was a weeding out process. I remember one day in practice, there was a kid from Grambling, and the coach had just said, look, the next person that gets beat deep, and we're cut. And so he went out there, and they cut, and he got beat deep, and he's jogging back to – and that's the coach is like, no, son, go ahead and collect your check. Get your bus ticket and go home and sell insurance. You're cut. Next. <laughs> and I was next no. up, and you know I did not get beat. Oh! <laughs> next up, Reggie Grant. <laughs> <laughs> they, they sent him off with, with no love, no kisses, just the bus that. ticket and his last that paycheck. It's about competition. Can you rise <laughs> to the level to be competitive? Well, Reggie, that... Now, that, got, that, that that does have me wondering, what was the mental adjustment that you had to make? You've got to make this adjustment from college to the NFL because everyone in the NFL is good. What was that adjustment? Every time you, you, you elevate to a next level, you have to elevate your game, right? Be that mm -hmm. in business or be that in athletics. Um, so from high school to college, you know, you get to college, there's 30 freshmen. Everybody's all state, all American, all this, all that, right? Do right. you elevate? Can you elevate mentally? Right. Can you or you do have a work ethic to go in the weight room and I hated lifting weights, but I went in there and and did it to the best of my ability or run and practice and, and be committed to your success. Right. And the same thing with going to the pros. Everybody can run fast and jump high. Right. Mm -hmm. The guy that gets cut is probably physically the same or superior to some of the people that, that don't that make it. But it's about your mental toughness. I remember mm -hmm. Levi Armstrong, who was the seventh pick and I was the ninth pick. That was from UCLA and the big school and all that. And I was just from Oregon, you know, he's in the, he was my roommate for there for a few minutes before they cut him. And then, uh, you know, man, it's her, her. I ain't whining. I'm just grinding. I'm making this team. I'm not going home. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody got to go. And it ain't Reggie Grant, baby. <laughs> Take away the inside. I'm dying before you get inside of me. <laughs> there is no getting inside of me if that's my job. I'm to the best of my ability or I'm going to die trying. <laughs> die trying <laughs> well reggie from your time in the the nfl and the cfl who would you say was the best wide receiver that you saw in the nfl well again i got to practice good every day wesley was a beast and you know steve Jordan was a phenomenal guy he was the cooper cup he was he was just a, a guy that was relentless and if you play means you are just hungry that's about hunger, no more than anything else, right? So they're mm -hmm. serious about their business, and you have to be serious about it. But Steve Largent was a great wide receiver because he just had that that desire, that innate uh, um, intangible, that hunger. You have mm. to have that hunger to want to do that, to be able to to be forced to, you know, to succeed or fail, but you're going to give it everything you got because, it's again, it's highly competitive, 
And that's why, you know, I've you know, been okay as a business person because I'm okay with competition. Competition is the pan of, of success. I mean, but he was there practicing grinding. You look at Steph Curry, right? He, he was, oh, this little skinny guy. And now look at him now. He didn't set the bar at another love game in the NBA. So it's mm-hmm. about mental toughness. He's just mentally tough. Yeah. And one of the things that you said, Reggie, is that you do the things you don't want to do with a hunger that you don't have to want to do those things. Is that right? Well, hunger for success. And you ha- we all have to do things. We That's the nature of life. But those are the steps that you need to take in order to be successful. Yeah, things like starting a business and not having process and procedures. How do you move forward? You need a map. You need that GPS. Now, do you have to adapt and adjust along the way? Of course. And, and be able to, to, to adjust on the fly. That's one of the pillars and in life. Right, you have to adapt and adjust, and embrace change. Change is going to happen. Three years, adapt, adjust, or die. Everywhere, on the field, off the field, coming into off the field, Reggie. How? I mean, because your whole life has resolved has revolved around sports. In high school, even before high school, if it's not football, it's basketball, and it's continually re- revolving around athletics. How do you now prepare yourself mentally to transition? You know outside the NFL, life without the NFL. What was that like? For me, I was always prepared to not, what was my car? When the tires when the tires blew out, I just got some new tires. When the engine blew out, I just got another car. So football for me was my vehicle to that University of Oregon education. It was always about the knowledge, the skill. And sometimes I'd even take a class or two that I was about the knowledge more so than the grade. So I probably could have had an even better GPA, but I was more so about knowledge uh, that I could leverage and and, and use in my life after sports. And I knew that I was, you know, I was 5'9", 169, 169 pounds when I left high school, 185 when I left the University of Oregon. So, you know, I wasn't a big guy, but I was, you know, pretty intense. I was, you know, (laughs) I remember breaking one of my friend's nose. He was a wide receiver in practice one day. And he's like, you know, you know, you broke... Man, come on, man. When we when we leave, we can go chase girls and do our little thing. But when we're out there between the lines, I'm serious about my business, no matter what it is. So, you know, he didn't understand that. And that's the reason I went to the next level and he didn't. He didn't have that intensity, that that passion, that hunger, that desire, mm. and, and that intrinsic um you know, I, I'm just about what I need to get done and I'm going to do everything in my, in my power to be successful. I don't need to hurt anybody else. I don't need to steal from anybody else. I just need to do what I do and stay in my lane and focus on Reginald and add value to other people, but I need to take care of my stuff. Mm, I like that. I, and after it's over between the lines, yes, we should go chase girls, go to the clubs as you as should. It's the man creed and he should have known it. <laughs> <laughs> the, who was it jerry glanville who said the nfl stands for not for long amen <laughs> so coming out of the nfl reggie what was your first job outside the nfl my first job i think i probably did some little sales or something like that uh-huh. uh I ended up uh, going to St. Louis and staying for six months and, and piddling around in St. Louis for a little bit and going back to Seattle uh, briefly and worked the family fitness centers and then ended up going to Atlanta, Georgia. We bought a health club in Atlanta and turned it uh, from and had never been profitable. It was an old European health spa. We bought that. And in uh, less than a year, we were, were generating, you know, 17,000 a month in, in accounts receivable every month. And then we were generating new sales. And, and uh, we, again, we turned that around. Um, so I was in the health and fitness business doing sales and, and, mm-hmm. and working and doing those kind of things and, all, and everything else you need to do when you're a small operation, you're facilitating the process. And I just, you know, built upon those skills. And, and I, nobody had to tell me to get up and go to work. I mean, I, I get up and do my thing. Um, so that's part of those skills that I developed as a young person, as an athlete, 
And athletes have an advantage because they're so used to getting up and doing the thing what they need to do. And that's, that, you know, just getting up and doing it. Whether it's working out, I remember running those hills in Seattle and I say, often say, or once in a while I'd say, I, you know, ran myself out of poverty, right? I'd get that 25. It was the old weight jacket. It was a, a had had pellets in it. And it was 25 pounds. And I get that, that run that hill at six in the morning, just be out there grinding. I was a man on a mission. I needed that college education. <laughs> running hills. With weight jackets. These are the old weight jackets with pellets in them. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It wasn't the fancy, dancy stuff they have now. <laughs> they do. Adapt, adjust, and do what you need to do. Now, Reggie, you also mentioned that you spent some time as, now, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, time as an English teacher or helping in the class? I, no, I taught, I was, I'm a certificate of English teacher. I was taught for 17 years. It, it, urban kids and uh, with some, I started out in Godfrey's Middle School, which is one of the toughest schools in the United States of America, maybe the world. We used to have lockdowns, so I taught English for 17 years, um, and I tried to do everything I do at a high level. So yeah, I ended up uh, working on the high school exit exam. I was on the team that actually developed the English component of that, and they're still using the the uh, LPAC, which is the, the English as a test that you take as an English language learner. Um, and that uh, on the state board for that to write that that exam and to review that. Um, so yeah, 17 years in the classroom, taught urban kids here in Los Angeles. I also had a contract with a, a school out of Paris where I taught international students. And you know, Kaplan used to own the biggest la English language uh, company uh, with the SAT company. I actually had an English language division. I worked for them several summers and, and facilitated that process and, and got to talk to meet uh, kids from around the world and kids inherently all want to be loved and, and be elevated. And, and that's what they're looking for. And then whether you're, they're urban kids and, and socially economically uh, challenged or whether they come from Paris. I had, a, again, a, a contract with a French Jewish uh, school in Paris, France. And I used to teach uh, for seven years until the pandemic hit. Every summer, we'd have uh, 80 uh, international students from Paris and surrounding countries, French Jewish kids. And we teach them at American Jewish University. And uh, had a staff and did all that. And I currently still teach a summer program for Boston College, uh, oh. a sports management class. So yeah, I was a teacher full time, 17 years. But why said he doesn't benefit? So uh, booyah, it is yeah. what it is. <laughs> well, well done, my friend. So you, now you may have mentioned it, but I'm, I'm kind of, as I'm looking at my notes here, I just want, want to hear from you. What are some of the characteristics that made you a successful athlete that transitioned into helping you become a successful business person? Well, it's simple. You just have to work. It's called work. There are no easy paths in life. There is no simple, quick, get quick. Uh, every time somebody does something, get quick is get get lost. <laughs> quick. <laughs> lose money, lose time, lose focus. Uh, <laughs> You know, life is not that complicated, right? Yeah. Okay. Go well, elevate somebody else, somebody you love, you love them, and, and just, you know, elevate, live in the moment. You know, today is cash, the best day of my life. Some people, well, I'm about, no, no, no. I, I enjoyed where I was at, but today is cash, the best day of my life. Yesterday's a canceled check I can never retrieve. Tomorrow's a promissory note I may never collect. Today is cash, the very best day of my life. Embrace it, enjoy it, enjoy your journey. Find something that makes you smile and do it. Tomorrow's a promissory note I may never collect. Exactly. Today, I'm, today is cash, the best day of my life. Embrace your journey. <laughs> I'm writing that one down, Reggie. I got it here I on the post-it note. I got a t-shirt. I'll send it to you. <laughs> I've written it on a post-it note. So technically, I've copywritten it. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Reggie, we, we hear a lot about athletes as they're transitioning out of professional, um, pro professional athletics. You know, life outside that, it, it can be a difficult walk. What, adv what advice would you give to any professional athletes who are now looking and thinking about retiring, because after this, they're going to start thinking a few things here after they hear you. I mean, thinking about retiring, you're going to retire, whether you do, do like Tom Brady did and retire on your own terms, or they cut your behind, right? <laughs> that is not a, a professional athlete. Athletics is an opportunity. They're to make real money now. 
if you position that right, you win for life. If you don't, you'll be like everybody else um, in, a, in a not in a positive place. But transitioning is always going to happen. Prepare for the transition. For me in college football, uh, again, paid for my college education and I you know, embraced and tried to do everything I do at a very high level with full blown passion and, and, and commitment. And so I just transitioned that into professionally and always preparing for there will be a life after I can run fast and jump high. Because, you know, Brady, for example, is a great example. He set us up with two companies and then they went and raised $170 million the month before he retired while he was still active and leveraged that active ability. And then he's like, when he saw, when I saw that, I was like, look, he's retired. He's done. Because, you know, he just, he's positioned himself to win. And that's what you have to do. Think about where you're going to go. And you don't have to have all the answers. It's just like being going to college and saying, I want to study business or marketing or engineering or whatever, and then you change. But that's okay. Adapt, adjust, and enjoy. So you just have to prepare yourself mentally to, for, that you pass. You can't jump high, and they can either cut you, and, and you be unprepared, or they can cut you, and you can just make that smooth transition. And every athlete goes through the wilderness, right? Because mm -hmm. you've been doing something since you're 12, 15, whatever years old. So because part of who you are, uh, I was a football player. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. I eat what I kill. I kill what I eat. <laughs> and it's okay. So just be prepared. And one of our young guys, I work with, with a group that's the uh, premium award in the nation for African-American male scholar athletes for the last 30 years. They have their 30th anniversary in Washington, D.C., March 11th and 12th. And Jelani Jenkins, who played uh, five years in the league and four years as a starting linebacker for the Miami Dolphins, is one of the Watkins kids. So I've known him since he's 17, 18 years old. And he's got a new company called Postseason, where they're actually helping the athletes transition, the green mm. community, mental health opportunities, courses, the whole dynamic that, wow. that helps athletes, whether you're a high school athlete that transitions and doesn't play in college, you're a collegiate elite athlete, and then you get hurt or you, or you your career ends and you don't go professional. That's we understand that most, 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 most people will not become professionals. So how do you navigate and take all those skills and all that work you put into place and transition that into, into life after sports? And it's a simple. You just kind of take those work ethic and skills and apply it and enjoy the journey. Because you live a lot longer for most of us after the, your screaming stops than you do as an athlete. Well, Rich, I mean, the, you know, the, the life, life expectancy, I should say, per, you know, career expectancy in the NFL, three to five years. And by the no, time. No, 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 no. 1.5 is the average, right? So Brady is anomaly. So he skews the whole, whole balance of it, right? You have guys that play 8, 10, 15, 12, 15 years. Average guy is not even going to make pension. Pension is three, three years, right? And they make seven hundred fifty thousand minimum now. When I played, I made twenty six thousand base, ten thousand bonus, so I made about thirty nine thousand dollars, right? <laughs> now you know, but they make a week. I made, I made for the whole season, right? And then you somebody, Chris Ward, who's the first round pick for us, the fourth overall pick. He only got a fifty thousand dollars signing bonus. Nowadays, your second round pick, you get a two million signing bonus, and you know, makes hundreds of thousands per year you know, or a million. And if you position that right, you can live well. You just put some away and, and figure out the process and, and the rest of it will take care of itself. Leverage your opportunity while you're a professional athlete is all I have to say to the guys. All right, Reggie, it, some of the characteristics, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, make sure I get it right, that I hear you saying perseverance, focus, uh, discipline, setting a regimen, if you have those skills as an, as an athlete, and you got to have them, those skills can be transitioned into the business world, correct? 100%. You are at an advantage as an athlete because that's been ingrained in who you are, right? So right. all you have to do is take and move that into whatever it is that you enjoy. Of course, if you can, you'll find something that you're passionate about, that you enjoy doing, whether it's in corporate America, right? Whether it's starting your own business, you're always going to have to learn new things and just be open to learn. Smart people are always learning. When I was teaching 12 to 17 year olds in high school and middle school, I was learning every day. And, you know, I, I make them laugh and they make me laugh and you embrace the journey, embrace the process. But 
And athletes have an advantage because they've, again, been so trained into uh, regiments and routines and perseverance and discipline and work ethic. And you can just utilize that for your, as your superpower and, and leverage that as you move forward in business. Mm. Reggie, how can people get in touch with you? It's simple. I'm, I can't hide. ReginaldGrant.com. You can find me all the time. Again, Reginald Grant, R-E-G-I-N-A-L-D-G-R-A-N-T.com. And from there, you can find all my other little things that we do. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm available. Google me and you'll find me. I can't hide. You'll see my shiny blah ball here somewhere on the line, right? So there's 50,000 Reginald Grants out there, but you know, I'll pop up first because I own that space, baby. <laughs> 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 Reggie, thank you so much, sir. Folks, if you're not pumped up a little bit after this interview, I would suggest you, you check your pulse. There's something wrong if you're not fired up after listening to Mr. Grant. <laughs> thank you so much, Michael. Reggie, thank you. I'm Mike Temple, business leadership experts. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Reggie Grant. Thank you. Have an exceptional day. <laughs> <laughs>